yeah, this is going to be awesome. So I met Joel a year ago in Barcelona. He visited me for like a week. Uh, and I just had the uh, time to pick his brain and learn a lot of stuff uh, from him. Yeah. And actually, like all the years, I have known Joel uh, by following him on Twitter and just like following his blog. Um, and I think like he's one of the most knowledgeable remote working uh, leaders out there. Yeah. So I hope, you know, I can really go in deep and actually do like a, a more advanced talk on remote work, especially regarding like scaling and issues that, that you that you faced. Uh, and also, I mean, you have been at this like for many years. Uh, so there's also a ton of experience. And also like something I really admire about Buffer and Joel is like they challenge the status quo and they experiment. So he has probably tried most of the stuff that you want to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Amir. I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's an amazing setting for this. And I've learned a lot already in the last day and today. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for traveling from all over and things. So yeah, let's get going. I'm really excited to chat. Yeah, so we will cover different topics and we have tried to like kind of uh, s section this into like different topics so it's not like all over the place. Um, so one of the topics is transparency and Buffer is like radical transparent. Um, another is like advantages, disadvantages, um, team culture and workflows and how they have actually advanced over this during the years. Uh, another thing is balance and mental issues, uh, which I think actually becomes problem as, as you grow and especially as you work a lot of years in, in remote work setting. And then also the future, both for like buffer, but also like remote work itself. Yeah, so let's kick it off like with transparency. Uh, so one of the stuff is that buffer is like ultra transparent. So you can actually see the revenues uh, they make like 18 million per uh, per year. I know that Joel makes like 250,000 uh, per year, uh, yep. and you, I can actually see the the salaries of all his uh, people. You know, I need to speak with my finance team because I need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then uh, they also share all the financial uh, information on like bare metrics. Um, yep, everything's there: churn rates, um, customer acquisition revenue, um, all the margins, everything's there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty insane, especially like I think internally, maybe, but like publicly, it's kind of very uh, strange. So I would actually love to know the story of transparency and also like how it relates to remote setting and if, you'd, if it's something that you would actually recommend others. Yeah, that's a great one to start with. Um, so in terms of a little bit of the history of transparency at Buffer. Um, so I had a previous uh, startup that I worked on for about a year and a half before Buffer. And um, during that time, and also the start of Buffer, um, I really didn't know anyone. I didn't know anything really. Um, I just graduated from uh, university in the UK. And uh, you know, it was really just a nobody, uh, very naive. Um, and I went out and just started talking to people and, and trying to learn as much as I could, soak up the knowledge from others. Um, and I just found that if I would go there and share everything, um, then I would really get so much more value back. Um, you know, as soon as I opened up, they would open up and share their numbers, share their learnings. And, and so that was one of the key things, I think, um, near the beginning for transparency. Um, and then I, I was also quite early on Twitter. Um, and I, uh, after graduating um, from university, went back to my hometown, Sheffield in the UK. Um, so me and Dom from uh, pretty nearby places up in the north. Uh, and uh, there's really, there were, at that time, um, it was 20, uh, 2009, 2010, um, absolutely nothing going on for tech startups uh, in, in that area of the country. And so I started going on Twitter and uh, just started sharing a lot of, okay, this is an article I've read, it's been useful, this is, some, this is something we've tried and it worked, this is something we've tried, it didn't work. Um, and again, the more I shared, the more I found that um, people would uh, become connected and I would meet people that way. And I started from network that way. I started a small meetup for um, technology founders uh, in, in Sheffield. Um, we had one going in Manchester as well um, at the time. And it really just developed from there. 
And then so by the time starting Buffer, I was already sharing these things uh, on Twitter and meeting people that way. Um, and it had been really the foundation of me building this uh, network and getting so much value. Um, and it just felt natural to, to carry it forward. Um, and then started Buffer and uh, me and my co-founder, uh, Leo, we were talking about um, you know the numbers a lot. And at that point, very casually sharing things on Twitter, we were just and there would always be like this next stage of, oh, should we share the revenue? That seems, I have not seen anyone do that. Should we do that? Like, but why shouldn't we do that? I've not seen, why not? Like, what's, what's really going to happen? And I think there was like a series of those things where he said, okay, let's try it. And then kind of think, okay, the world's probably going to end when we do this. Um, and, then, and then we shared the numbers and, and uh, nothing happens, and a lot of great things happened as well. I think it's one of those things where it's really easy to think about all the things that can go wrong, all the risks. Really easy to think about those things. Um, competi competitors have it. Um, all of our salaries are public. You can Google buffer salaries. We've got a spreadsheet. Um, everything's there. The formula for how we calculate salaries is also public. People will say, well, now I know how much everyone makes in your team. I can go and offer them $5,000 more, and uh, they'll come to my team. And you know. That didn't happen. Uh, so that's been those things. And then about uh, two and a half years into the company, we decided we really need, we should set down our, our values and, um, uh, or at least artic articulate the, the values, right? Because um, every company has a culture, whether you're deliberate about it or not. Um, and so we said, let's, let's try and put these into words. And by that point, it was very clear. We uh, asked the team, we were about 10 people at the time, what should we, uh, you know, what 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 would the values be if you would describe the culture and the values right now? Uh, how would you describe them? And transparency was an obvious one. Um, we we were already doing it. Um, it was very natural to us, and we decided to phrase it as default to transparency, um, and that really pushed us to that kind of more of the extreme. And we just tried to flip it around and say, by default, it's transparent. Um, unless there's a really, really good reason not to be. And uh, we've, we've pushed that limit a few times. We found some things that there are good reasons not to be and pull those back, but we really try and uh, push those boundaries there. Um, and so, yeah, after we put those, the values into words, that was when we published salary, salary numbers, um, equity formula and numbers as well. Um, and then we, uh, a couple of years later, we were in touch with Bear Metrics, which is this uh, um, SaaS analytics uh, kind of dashboard. Um, it's mainly for internal use, um, but we got chatting with them and they said, how about if as a demo of our product, we made your metrics fully open for anyone? So you can go to buffer.bearmetrics.com and see basically their whole product with our numbers in them. And it's you know meaningful, real product numbers. Um, so things like that, and there's just more and more things. And, and we've just found it's been incredible for um, many different things within the team and um, also for hiring. And people, we have people look, uh, interview at a buffer and sometimes they come and say, I know more about your company than the company I'm currently working at. <laughs> um, and so there's been many benefits and I think in terms of the, the way it relates to remote as well, um, I think when you're working remotely, um, and we've been doing it for about seven and a half, eight years, and the technology's improved drastically. We started on Skype, and videos are dropping out all the time. Then we moved to Hangouts, it's a bit better. Zoom is incredible now. Um, but that technology is improving all the time to make it even easier. Um, but in some ways, things are against you a little bit. It's not the way that's not the, the the way it's been done, and things. It's not what people know. And I think it's much easier in a remote environment to not have the information you need. Um, you can't be in an office, go and tap on someone's shoulder and say, "What's this number that I need for this thing?" Um, so that's been a key benefit we've seen as well of of transparency within the team. Is it really democratizes that? decision making and that power um everyone has that information um it's you you can go and find it so yeah uh, actually something that i think is very interesting is like most of the remote companies are very transparent like in this the only thing that isn't public internally for for people are the salaries everything else like we have like two private channels and they are related to like finances and salaries 
uh, and everything else, like leadership discussions, everything is public. Uh, and like maybe I think uh, like remote setting actually pushes you to do that, uh, and also like it builds trust, uh, yeah. so people you know can trust you more. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I just find it fascinating that actually like it's not something that we have actually designed. It's just like something that you evolve into. Yeah. Yeah, and in some ways maybe remote kind of pulls it out of you. You have you really have to. Um, start to be more transparent to make remote work in, in many ways. And obviously, there's different levels you can go to. I'm not suggesting everyone here, every company should go out and publish all the salaries of, of every team member. Um, but there's, there's definitely small steps you can take. And uh, it's almost uh, you know inevitable. Those, those steps you take are going to make improvements. Yeah, so the next topic that's very related to this, and actually, like we did this. Uh, like uh, two weeks ago, it's like salaries and salary formula, and especially in a remote setting, I think like it's currently very hot, uh, and it's there's like many different views of how you should pay remote workers, um, and I would actually love to to hear how you evolve your salary form. And actually, some of the incredible things is that it has been done in a public fashion, which is usually not the case. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've had multiple versions of our salary formula, and the, the, the overall idea is to have a fully transparent formula um, for as it happens to be transparent within the team and public as well. Um, and uh, it, was, it was transparent internally for about eight months before we made it public, um, so definitely good to go through that step. Uh, but we, yeah, every version is out there. Um, we've got multiple different blog posts about the different versions. Um, initially, it was very basic. We were only about uh, 10 to 15 people uh, at the time. And one thing I would say with a, having a salary formula is it's never going to be perfect. You're always going to have to evolve it. Um, and I don't even know if a formula is, is necessarily the right mechanism, but for us, it, it's something that works. Um, and the thing is, even you know, when you're 15 people, the types of roles, um, the depth that those roles go to, um, it, it's going to be very, very different than when you're, uh, you know, even 30 people. You start adding new different roles in, and so then you've got to redesign the system and things. Um, and I think for us, uh, it started very basic. So there's there's, there's some kind of obvious components uh, for us around role, experience level, and seniority. Uh, in the team, and then location is another uh, key factor for us. And location has been a very interesting one for us as a remote company um, because, you know, I think there's that whole debate of do you pay based on the local market rates, um, or do you pay something more? Uh, you know, we've had some uh, people that have been commenting on our blog posts and things over the years saying well, aren't they providing the same value to the company no matter where they are? So shouldn't you pay them the same? I think this is a really interesting topic for us. Um, one thing we have found, which I think has been really uh, inspire, really fun for us to be able to move the needle on, is that uh, we are paying uh, some of our team members in. Um, we've got uh, people, someone in Sri Lanka, um, someone in uh, uh, Paraguay, and, and we have people in Cape Town and things. And some of these like lower cost of living places often are places, um, Sri Lanka, for example, I think one of the amazing benefits of remote working that we found is that we, we generally pay quite a bit above market for those uh, areas because we don't want there to be such a huge gap in the team. Um, and then by doing that, we found that uh, that person actually you know, other people benefits of remote working. They can travel while they work. They can maybe spend more time with family. And um, for this person, he doesn't have to leave his country, which is his home, when he loves, um, in order to try to go and make a, a a decent living and then send money back and not be able to be with his family. So um, things like that have been amazing as well. Um, and so that's for us. I think the direction we're going um, to think about the next five, ten years, uh, when you have a fully remote company really uh, location agnostic, um, probably is moving towards that. Those, the, the gap there um, becoming reduced, at least for us. I think that's the direction that, that we're going. Um, but when you're, when you're early, it may be harder to pay above market, things like that. And so another thing for us is because we have the salary formula and we pay above market, we really have no negotiation. Um, because 
the, the formula's there. We can't, what, what can we do? Like, it's, it's there. And, um, but, the, but the great thing is that the way that uh, neg negotiation happens a little bit is that people question the formula. And that's great because it's fully open. So you can you know, bring that up and, and share that feedback. You can share it anonymously. You can share it um, you know, individually with us. And, and then we've made a lot of changes based on that. So yeah. Awesome. Actually, we, we got really inspired by the recent update. So I can definitely check it, uh, recommend to check it out, the, the salary form. Like if you want to streamline your salaries and make them like more fair, I think it's a great uh, like starting point. Yeah. And something that's very related to like uh, salaries and something that we also have discussed a lot internally. And I think like for you, it's probably more problematic uh, given that everything is public. It's basically like how do you promote people uh, um, and I think especially, you know, this is something that we could discuss, uh, but if we won't do it, it's like um, if we actually look at the skill level and contribution level inside organizations, I think actually it's like not normalized. So it's like borrow law. So you have like some people that are really amazing and contribute a lot. And then uh, you have some people th that, that just contribute a bit. Uh, and that's just like the fact, I think. Uh, yeah, um, so I would actually love how this works inside Buffer and, and how you actually think about this. Yeah, it's a good question because I think one of the, you know, we, we try and make the salary formula very objective. Um, it, it's just there, it's, it's factual. Um, there's different locations. Um, we try and base it off numbers for the living costs of each place and, and things like that. Um, but the uh, kind of experience level and you know what your uh, role is and seniority of your role is is probably the the one key aspect that is uh, obviously subjective and um, based on the manager deciding you know are they hitting that next level and they uh, are, the, are they ready for a promotion um so for us i think the key evolution in that for us is that we've had to become a lot more explicit about um what level are you at and what does it take to get to the next level so we've developed a lot of um career frameworks across the different teams. In the engineering team, we have a career framework. We have a career framework in our customer advocacy team. And um, one thing we, we had to do, which an evolution from the first version of our formula, um, the first version really just had uh, a few different brackets of what experience you are, you know, kind of uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced, that, that kind of thing. And we really had to develop a lot more uh, granularity in, in those levels and a lot more detail of what it means if you are hitting it or not hitting that level, what are the different factors that are involved? Um, I think that's been the key thing for us. Um, in terms of the power law you mentioned, I think I guess that could be said to be true is uh, that you know some people might have a much outsized contribution, and how do you handle that? Um, I think again with the the different levels you have for us, those those levels um, basically translate into multipliers in the salary for us. Um, and so you could really, if, if depending on the approach you have at your company, if you say, okay, the biggest contributors have much outsized uh, kind of contribution, you could say, well, that's like a 2x multiplier over the other people or that kind of thing. Um, for us, it's a bit more uh, of, a, of a regular kind of gradient there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we will switch topics. Uh, just like yeah. briefly and discuss like advantages and disadvantages and maybe like focus more on the disadvantages and how you handle them. Um, so uh, what do you think is like the biggest disadvantage, especially like over the long haul for remote work? And you know, what things and solutions uh, do you see we can apply? Yeah, I think um, I'll take a couple of, of the disadvantages and dig into those. So probably one is on a personal level um, for all the team members. I think for us, um, so just a bit of context, we're 75 people um, and we have no office. And uh, even in the biggest like hub cities, I think the most people we have is maybe three or four people, even in places like New York um, and London, things. Um, so there's really n not too much uh, social interaction and that leads to loneliness. And, and it's a big challenge, I think, in a remote company this is a whole new thing that we've not had to really deal with, with before in, in the workplace settings. So um, that's been something that we've focused quite a lot on o over time and, and tried to make a lot of uh, efforts towards improving that. Um, and a lot of it is that you have to be very deliberate in a remote setting to have 
um, you know, kind of water cooler, fun, spontaneous conversations, uh, get to know each other on a personal level. It's very easy in a remote company, you, you all know this, to um, have meetings set up for specific, uh, you know, uh, bits of work that you're trying to get done and have no time at all because you go into that meeting and it's set up, it has an agenda you're, you know, and a lot of people talk about it, like, you've got to make sure you have a very clear agenda, have a lot of discipline around the meeting otherwise it's not productive as well and I think it all moves towards like everything has a purpose, um, you don't have time to just, you know, kick things around, talk about things. So uh, we've developed, um, we have something every Friday, we have uh, I think uh, Lara from GitHub was mentioning a similar thing. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm remembering correctly, but um, we have what we call impromptu hour, um, and it's basically an open Zoom call. People jo jump in, and uh, they can just say what's going on, what they, what's their weekend plans, what are they up to, um, and we have those conversations. And a really cool uh, Zoom feature that I'm not sure if you might be aware of, we've discovered recently is. Um, and we do the all hands on Zoom as well. So if 75 people all individually dialing into Zoom. Um, but you can also do uh, breakout rooms. And uh, it's a feature of Zoom where you can, with one click of a button, say, OK, we want to have everyone split into separate uh, video meetings, five p people per room. Um, and it just immediately splits them off. And you can have it so split off and then come back. So sometimes we'll be you know, having all hands discussing uh, a particular topic. We want to have one to go off, and uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're in a big room and you have uh, multiple different tables there, and you say, okay, each table is going to discuss it, and then one person's going to come back and talk about it. So um, that's been good as well. Um, I found one thing: I'm an introvert. I found the impromptu hours were growing, and then it got to the point where, okay, now it's a video call of 50 people. Um, I don't want to be the one to uh, just share my weekend with 49 other people. Um, so that the, the the Zoom rooms has been really useful for that. Um, we also recently have uh, started to uh, work with a company called Joyable, and uh, they are connecting um, for everyone that is is interested in the team. And quite a lot of people have taken us up on this. They'll connect each team member with uh, a qualified therapist, um, and we are providing that uh, as a benefit. So um, wow, that's that, that's a good idea. Yeah, it's, I think it's been really great. A lot of people have, have done it. And I think it's one of those things that, um, you know, in different countries, there's different, it, it might be more normal, might be a bit of a stigma around it. Um, but when you make it easy for people and you say, Here's it, here it is, here are the steps, just sign up, uh, make it really easy, um, people do it and, it. and it's been really beneficial for people. Um, I think another thing is as well that we really try and have uh, managers in the team will uh, make sure to have these conversations with uh, team members as well and say how's it going and just have, try and have a very open um, communication, open culture around that and honestly that comes from, it doesn't work unless the managers do it as well and it comes from the leaders setting that example. So um, you know, last year I was, I was struggling um, and I'd, I'd been working on uh, Buffer for almost seven years at that point, hadn't taken too many breaks, completely burned out. Um, and I was really just starting to struggle, and I felt like, wow, okay, I'm, uh, I'm not functioning too well now. I'm not being very productive. Um, so uh, I, I basically sent a message to the team and said, I'm actually going to take some time off. Um, I, I'm burnt out, and I, I need to take some time off. And I sent that to the whole company. Um, I ended up taking two months off, and uh, I was very energized when I came back, excited again. And burnout's a funny thing because I knew I was still excited, passionate about the company, the idea, everything, um, the pot potential of it. Um, but when you're burned out, you you just have no motivation. I I, I just I didn't want to do I didn't want to do it when I woke up in the morning. So um, yeah, and I think that was really really helpful for the team. So and that's that's hard as leaders. I think um, you know the image that's portrayed. You have to you're superhuman. You've got the Elon Musk's and the Jack Dorsey's, you know, two public companies, no problem, superhuman, no emotion. Um, but I think that's a false image, and we have to break break through that, um, especially going forward. So. Yeah, actually, like that could be a great next uh, topic. Is basically like the the um, the balance element and uh, like mental uh, health, because actually, like once you have been into this environment for many years that is going to become an issue. And actually, that's also something that we have seen uh, in Duist, is like people uh, 
like are experiencing like, anxiety and depression um, and loneliness, isolation. Um, and I think actually that's something that we probably need to acknowledge that this is actually a, a problem in a remote work setting. And we need to actually work actively to figure out like how do we actually combat this. Uh, yeah, and I have like myself been into this loop early on in my career um, because I think it's very easy to make like very brutal uh, rituals or like uh, daily patterns and just you, you go in a spiral and then it just got, becomes worse and worse and like you end up, you know, uh, like crawling. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I would actually love to, to discuss like how you actually handle these. And I think like if you go for 10 years in a remote setting, like you will hit, hit this at some point, like, um, and how do you handle this like on a team level and on, on a personal level? Um, yeah, I think um, one of the things we've done is to make sure everyone's taking time off. Um, and that's that's not always that easy. Um, and maybe some of you also have, a, we, one thing we did is we have a unlimited uh, vacation uh, kind of concept. And we found, um, and this has been talked about in the last few years, I think uh, people found like, well, actually, when you put that in place, people take less time off um, because now they don't want to be the one asking for it. Um, it's easier when you have set number of days off um, to to say, okay, I'm going to use those days. Um, but uh, we we changed it um, about a year and a half ago, and we changed it from unlimited vacation to minimum vacation. Um, I I'm, I'm idealistic. I like to change things and question things. I really didn't want to go to a, a regular. Here's your you know, however many weeks off. Um, so I didn't want to let go of that upper limit, but I, I, rec I acknowledge that we, we did have a bit of a problem there. So now it's a, a minimum amount of time, and the people team in, in the company is actually che checking in with individuals um, at, at certain points throughout the year and saying, you've not taken um, much time off yet. Do you have something planned? Do you have some time off planned? Um, that's been really effective for us. I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Um, I would actually love to to hear like how you think about scaling buffer, like and what are the actual limits of remote work, and do you actually have like upper limits or like I, I think like I love like I mean if we look at the companies uh, like Basecamp, they have basically like, kept their employee limit to 50 because they don't want to deal about scaling the company, and even like uh, do this like we have actually a hiring freeze right now, and we've had like for six months because we 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 don't want to add. A, a ton of people, um, yeah. So I would actually love to hear how you you think about this. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, how far do we want to scale it? Um, will it work to continue to scale? These are, these are all good questions. I think for me, um, I don't really set an upper limit on on how far because I think I've been through enough times now of thinking, oh, it'll be it'll be crazy when we're twenty people. I mean, I, when I started in my bedroom in, in uh, Birmingham in the UK, I thought, wow, if I could, at the time I had uh, two clients, I was working full time doing web development work for them, and I thought, wow, if, if I could even, you know, work, if I could just do half my time doing web development and, and have this thing working on the side, that would be great. And then I was like, wow, if I could work full time on this project, that would be incredible. So I think you go through enough of those stages and you think, well, I could never imagine being 30 or being 50 or being 70 um, and you start to realize like actually when you get to the prior point just before that point that um, you, you think about it a very different way. So I don't really set an upper limit but I will say um, that the pace at which you grow makes a huge difference um, and we grew from about 30 people to 94 people in about a year, a year and a half um, and uh, this was a uh, a couple of years ago, and it really a lot of things broke, um, and it was very difficult. Um, we got, you know, we're in a, we were in a position where half, over half the team were within the first six months or a year in the company. Teams didn't work well together, um, you know, uh, and things. So I think there's a huge difference between growing from, uh, you know, say 25 to 100 in one year versus going from 25 to 100 in three years or five years. Um, and I think, for, for at least for me, I, when you're doing, when you're 
challenging the existing models and you're trying to say what is a better future, you know, let's not work you know, based on the concepts of the industrial age. Um, it, you, you have to work on your product um, for your customers. You have to work on your culture as well and, and your work environment. And there's just too much to, to say to just keep piling on extra problems on top without making sure that you have a solid foundation that you keep building on top of. So that's just my personal preference. I know others love that ride of just grow, 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 and like try and bring in people to fix problems, and it's just broken all the time. I mean, and it, and it is broken all the time even anyway, but um, for me, that's me I've learned is I, I want to kind of pace it. Um, but I don't set any upper limit because I think as long as we get that pace right, then we can um, keep adapting and make sure it feels great. One of the key measures for myself um, is if I project myself forward two years, do I think I'm going to wake up and hate this place and hate doing this work? Um, and uh, I have had that uh, feeling uh, a couple of times along the way. And I think that's the point when you have to make some changes and say, oh, let's, let's throw some things out and put some new things in place and, and make some big changes and things. Um, I think that's really the, the key way. Uh, do you think there's like an upper limit uh, of like fully distributed teams, like remote first, all around the world? Uh? I don't think so. Um, I, I think um, so much has changed in what, 10 years, 20 years, that you, you can't even say what will be the case in 10 years from now, or even five years from now. So um, the technology is adapting so quickly that um, I, I, I do personally believe that uh, like remote working is the future, it's the way it's going to be more of the norm at some point. I think it's going to take a lot longer than people might think. And, you know, uh, five years ago, people were saying, like, in five years, everyone will be doing this. And here we are, and we're 250 people here. Um, so I think it's taking quite a bit longer um, than people might think. But I still fundamentally believe that it is going to be a much more effective way to do things in the future. I think there are technologies enabling us even if we are in an office, to work more effectively together using remote methods in an office. So I, I think, like, um, I don't see any upper limit to it. The technology is going to keep getting much better. Cameras are going to get more wide angle. Um, I'm excited. I mean, some of these things feel like buzzwords, VR and 360 and things like that. But for us, you know, we do a retreat once a year. And um, uh, there's always a few people that can't make it or they can't travel as far or things like that. And so even things like uh, streaming it next year, I'm very keen for us to st stream all the sessions with 360 video and have a, a VR headset for the people that can't make it. Like These are obvious things that like seem a little bit out there right now, but actually in a few years, um, there'll be very normal ways of doing things. And I think it's going to keep about adapting. So I don't see any limit at all. Um, yeah, let's, let's go uh, to the, um, I'm actually unsure how many of companies here would be interested in this but like the thing with Buffer is like they have been on a very different paths so one path is like the VC path they did like a VC around uh, and then they kind of shift focus and became profitable uh, and I think this is like very fascinating because most companies don't do this like so you either go all in on either point and that's it uh, so I would actually love to, to hear and also like how is this related to, to remote work because actually like uh, especially like remote first companies I think it's probably harder to, to, to raise money because VCs don't really trust things that aren't proven yet um, yeah yeah it's a great topic um, so and, and for some context uh, Buffer uh, started out bootstrapped um, because I didn't know any any investors or I, I spoke to a few um, nothing worked out there so um, I reached a point where the only way I was going to be able to get it off the ground was to start generating revenue so I started off bootstrapped um, one one year in um, got some good growth we were about uh, just three of us and um, we went to San Francisco we went through a, an accelerator program um, and we raised a seed round five hundred thousand uh, dollars and um, we actually raised less than most companies were raising um, so most companies were going out raising 1.2 million, 1.5 million um, kind of seed rounds, um, giving up a lot more of their company. So we we did 500,000 out of 5 million uh, valuation. So that was about 10% of the company. Um, and then, and so we, and we were already, you know, 
have good revenues before that. And then we, and usually people say the, the typical amount of time from raising a round of funding to the next round of funding usually is about one and a half years, um, about 18 months people say you should go. So usually you've spent your money by then and you need more money and you're um, burning cash along the way and things. Uh, so, uh, but for us, we actually became profitable after that round of funding. Um, and we, uh, three years later, we had a million dollars in the bank. So we'd got this 500,000 in funding. We'd grown to having a million dollars in the bank. Um, and a few different things came together to, to enable us to then uh, raise around funding on very good terms. We raised three and a half million um, at a 60 million valuation. So it was only 6% of the company, 6-7% of the company. Um, and and uh, yeah, and, I th and by that point, the culture was very established. We were able to, um, you know, there was no real risk of saying, okay, we, you know, remote's in question or, or things like this. Um, but uh, I think for us, we have been kind of on that middle path, middle road there. Um, we didn't, most, I think most times when you go out and you raise a VC round of funding, um, you're going to give up 20, 30% of the company. You're going to have, you know, investors on the board. Uh, we didn't have that, that situation. Um, so we really tried to take this middle path. Um, and I think it's been a very interesting place for us to, to be, especially with remote working and transparency. Um, and I would say, and uh, you know, reflecting on, you take Atlassian, you take GitHub, um, and even I think GitLab as well, and as many of the companies that grow into quite a large scale, um, that which which are remote companies. What I've been tending to notice is that they usually will go quite a long time without raising funding. So in those examples, they, a lot of them have gone, uh, grown the revenues quite far before they've done it. I think it's because uh, you know you're doing things in a very different way than what's the, the current status quo. And so the earlier you get investors on board, the more you're going to probably have a bunch of uh, old white guys involved um, that are, you know have the ways of working that they're used to, and they're really going to um, be challenging everything that you're saying. So at least that's my opinion and some of the experiences I've had at times. Um, and I think one thing I've learned over time, for me at least, is that I really want to have the flex I want to have flexibility um, with the company. We want our team members to have flexibility. We want to have that flexibility as a company as well. Um, at one point in the journey of Buffer, uh, we decided that we wanted to try having no managers. Um, so we, for a period of nine months, we actually uh, said to all the managers, "You're going to do individual contributor work now," um, and we changed it all. and And it didn't work out. Um, and but. I think when you're a funded company, you got to, that growth has got to keep going. Every you know every quarter, you got to get, get that growth, and that's something that for me, I think, um, with remote work, we want to be able to experiment a ton um, and try things, and things fail, and things. So um, we've gone more of the path of kind of uh, becoming profitable, really controlling our own destiny, and being able to make some bold experiments. I want to be able to have a bad quarter. I want to have want to be able to have a bad year. Um, and and work through that and not just be uh, you know picked up and put onto the 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 track uh, you know so thank you um, actually something a bit related to this is that I think also some new funds are uh, are coming up that are kind of like more remote friendly uh, so we know some like indie VC and uh, uh, you mentioned it yesterday yeah, uh, purpose ventures yeah. is one that we've been working with. Yeah, so I think like hopefully you know they will also try to innovate their models so it's like more adaptable yes. to just like uh, yeah. the new companies. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's well, I think it's worth talking um, with uh, Dimitri as well from GitLab because they are on they've got VC funding and going that path and things and I I don't think you can't make it work. It's just that uh, I think we're at an early stage uh, with you know remote working and um, and even today compared to when we started. Uh, you know, eight eight years ago is uh, almost eight years ago. Uh, things are in a different place. It's more normalized now, even. So I would probably say over time it's going to be something that is less questioned. But we're probably still on that edge right now. And I think, um, and yeah, for for reasons of remote working, but also for other reasons of just um, not having such a binary path of unicorn or fail. Um, I think. 
there's the, there needs to be innovation in funding models and, and there is starting to be. So I think it's really positive. Well, thank you, Joel. Uh, I think amazing answers. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much.